I fixed it, everybody. All right, welcome, everybody. We are going to go over some basics real quick. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to use the Q&A feature down at the bottom of your screen. It says Q&A with a, little, a couple little chat bubbles. We have a lot of panelists here today helping answer any and all questions about hunting and as well as the fact that the chat is shut off. So you won't be able to use the chat feature, but you will be able to ask us questions through the Q&A. And another quick thing is um, we are recording this. These will go live on YouTube in uh, just a couple days. We have just finished prepping the last two in this series for the web. They should be up tomorrow. CPW does have a YouTube page. If you go to youtube.com and just type in Colorado Parks and Wildlife, you will find our YouTube page there and you will eventually be able to find these recordings available there. We have a couple polls that we're gonna be doing throughout the evening, and I am going to start with Brian introducing himself, and then we'll go around and give everybody a shot at introducing themselves and saying hi. Brian. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We've got a lot of uh, co-hosts, panelists that are on. They'll uh, be talking from time to time. Um, they'll be answering some questions in the background. We've got a whole group here uh, of people. I'm the statewide hunter outreach coordinator. I work out of the Denver office, but my job is to try and uh, reach out to some new hunters or hunters that already know how to hunt, but they're new to Colorado or existing hunters that just have some questions. So this is one of our ways to reach out. Great, let's go over to Courtney. Hi everyone, I'm Courtney Nicholson. Um, I lived in Colorado for about three years total, moved away and moved back again. Um, I'm a hunter ed instructor with the CPW um, and I also just uh, work in the hunting and fishing industry. I used to work for a hunting TV network and I uh, just can't get enough of it. So it's my day job, it's my evening, it's my whole life. So I'm really excited to talk to you all today. Great, all right, next we have Brendan. Brendan Howell, everybody. Hi everybody, uh, I am the hunting and angling outreach intern for the Northeast region of CPW. Uh, I'm originally from the East Coast, but I've been in Colorado for just about a year now. Um, this will be my second hunting season, so I feel like I bring a little bit of information from being that new resident um, as well, uh, and, and how I kind of operated and how um, I became a, a Colorado hunter. Thanks, Brendan. Uh, next on my list, I see Justin. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, Justin? Sure. I'm Justin Bubinick. I am a volunteer hunting ed instructor as well with CPW. I am new to Colorado. I grew up outside of Portland, Oregon, where I mostly waterfowl hunted, did a lot of upland bird hunting and fly fishing. So I'm relatively new to big game hunting. This will be my first season hunting Colorado. Um, so I'll be bringing in the new perspective on that front. Excited to be here. Great. And we have some wildlife officers with us. The first one I'm going to have introduce themselves is Logan. Hello, I'm Logan Wilkins. I'm the district wildlife manager um, in Lincoln County, um, out by Lyman and the Plains. Yeah. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> Much like a wildlife officer, very brief and to the point. Matt, would you care to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Matt Yamashita. I'm the area wildlife manager out of the Glenwood Springs office um, over in the Roaring Fork Valley. Um, been working for the, the agency for the past um, 15 years total. Uh, as par partially as a, a temporary and then um, 13 years as a full-time employee. Um, been over here in the Roaring Fork Valley for the past nine years. Great. Andre, hello. Andre is here, mostly answering questions in the Q&A section. Andre, would you care to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Andre Agley. I work in hunter education. Um, I'm also an instructor 
but there's so much more information that can be learned after initial hunter education. So I am here to further everybody's knowledge so everybody can get out there and be successful. Great. Lisa, Hi. we have another panelist. We hear that her internet is spotty because she's out uh, at her cabin, which sounds wonderful. Lisa, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Lisa Thompson, and I'm, pro I'm a professional hunter sponsored by Cabela's and Bass Pro and Mossy Oak. I'm out in my honey hole right now doing some shed hunting, but one of my greatest achievements to date is I just graduated twin daughters that are seniors, so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, I'm a co-founder of, yeah, I'm the co-founder of Hunt and Divas, and my love in life besides my family is mentoring uh, new hunters, so I'm thankful to be on this committee, and while I'm um, on this committee, I'm going to keep walking and look for sheds, and I can hear you guys, and I can answer any questions. <laughs> if I find one, I'll let you know. <laughs> I don't know if you can see the scenery behind me, but I'm showing you my honey hole right here. <laughs> Unfortunately, we can only see your picture, but if you send us GPS oh, okay. coordinates, we will all be there tomorrow. All right, and last but yeah, certainly I just not least, into four days. <laughs> last but certainly not least, we have Ms. Kathy Barnes. Hey everyone, my name is Kathy. I am the Southwest Region Education and Volunteer Coordinator, so I'm over here in Durango and excited to learn more about this topic. I'll be behind the scenes helping out with some Q&A. Great. All right, so today we are going to go over some big game scouting tips to help familiarize everyone with the landscape that they're hunting or tools to so that you can learn how to do that yourself. We don't we don't have tips for individuals here at this time on where you plan on hunting. Um, and so we are going to kick it off with Brian introducing the subject. I just want to let everybody know if you want to see every one of the panelists at the same time, you can hit gallery view at the top right of your screen and you can see all of us and if you only want to see whoever is speaking at the time you can hit hit it again and it will go back to speaker view so brian i'm tossing it over to you great thank you just a reminder to a few folks uh that may have have joined us we've got oh it looks like over 200 attendees on the list we do get a lot of questions so if a question doesn't get answered right away just be patient we have we have a bunch of folks that are trying to help answer those questions we we will be looking at some of those questions too so some questions that are going to be definitely based on the scouting in the field topic if we get a bunch of people asking the same thing we're going to have one of us uh, uh, other panelists the co-hosts we're going to come on we're going to try and answer it for everybody so if you get some other um, off the wall questions we'll, we'll do our best to answer them so all right so we are going to talk about field scouting today this is following up off of two previous webinars that we had. So this is our third webinar. The first webinar, that was all about virtual scouting. So if you don't know what that is, on our CPW website, we have the Colorado Hunting Atlas. You can um, Google, or not Google that, but search in our, our cpw.state.co.us website um, for the Colorado Hunting Atlas. It's great. Google Earth is great. There's a lot of other apps for um, your GPS, your smartphone, that kind of stuff that, that helps you with the virtual scouting. Last week, we talked about the hunt statistics. The statistics are on our website, on our big game page, really easy to look at it, they're free. Um, those webinars, like Crystal said, are gonna be posted and they will be available on our YouTube page um, shortly. So we'll be posting this as well. So feel free to share this with people. All right, tonight we're gonna to talk about field scouting. So we've already talked about virtual scouting, now let's get out into the field. The whole concept of field scouting, I think is important. And, and let, let's put it in a little bit of perspective here. Um, if you hired an outfitter, a guide to take you out hunting, you're paying for their expertise, but you're also paying for their knowledge because they've scouted that area, they're familiar with that area. You're paying for that when you hire a guide. If you're hunting on your own without a guide or an outfitter, you can increase your chances of harvest by investing in time pre-season. So we're gonna talk about a lot of parts to that as we get into it. Not all hunters are gonna have time to get out and, and scout for hours and hours at a time. We totally get it. I There's times that I've scouted, it's definitely helped me in my hunt, 
There's other times I've gotten out into the field. I left work at 6 p.m. I pull into camp at 11 p.m. I put up a tent in the dark and the next morning I get up in the dark and I haven't even been out there. My chances of success are pretty low. So um, I've, I've done it. I, I've also gone out and scouted and, and it's really worked out good for me. So there's, there's different ways. You got to decide for yourself what works for you. If you happen to be a hunter that is looking for, say, a trophy bull or a trophy buck, I highly encourage you to take, take some notes here, invest your time. I've, I know of some really good hunters. They, they've done some guiding. They've done some, some outfitting, but they also have hunted. Um, you know, we all hunt for meat first and foremost, but there are some people that get that bull tag, they get their buck tag, and sure enough, they want to wanna get a quality animal. If you are one of those hunters, maybe in a few years, that, that, that's the year that you want to go after a big bull or a big buck, I highly encourage you to think about scouting. And, and I'm going to th throw out a challenge to you. If you think about your entire time out on your hunt, think about maybe investing 80% of your hunt prior to, you, to your season scouting. Some of the best hunters know three, four, five bulls that are in the area that they want to go hunt and they pattern them. They know where they're at. They've chosen, I would like to shoot this one or that one. Those are some of the best hunters and those are probably the two or three percent of the best hunters that are out there in the field. So something to think about out there as well. So um, we're going to talk a little bit here, um, getting started. Matt's going to start off and he's going to talk to us about logistical scouting. So this is the stuff um, about hunting that has nothing to do with animals, right? This, but it's, it's important, right? It, to, to have a good successful hunt. These are a lot of logistics that you wanna, wanna look at. So I'm gonna turn it over to Matt. Thanks, Brian, appreciate that. Um, there's a, yeah, there's a, there's a lot to scouting. Um, I mean, it, it ranges everywhere. I, we covered in one of the previous sessions on the, the ability to use technology to your advantage, um, being able to do a lot of that from your house, from your desk. Um, there's a lot of resources. I think one important concept though is is some of this logistical side of things and actually ground truthing what you're seeing online, what you're what you're reading, um, what you're hearing, etc. Uh, there's there's a component of that 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 really it's it's essential for you as a hunter to be able to go out there and know for yourself. Um, you know, based on what somebody else said, that everybody has an opinion, they have an interpretation, a perspective of things. Um, you need to be able to go out there and verify what they're saying, what you're hearing, what you're seeing, and know how that plays into your style of hunting um, and what your plan is. Uh, this goes at everything from going out and just, just being present in the area. Um, take it all in, start learning the, the roads. Um, I mean, everybody has vehicles that are capable of, of different types of terrains. Uh, pay attention to, you know, if that terrain has the, the potential to change um, based on the amount of moisture in the ground. Um, you know, you need to be able, you need to know if, if we get a, a, a crazy early snowstorm and there's six inches of snow on the ground, if your vehicle is going to be capable of making it into that, that location that you scouted, um, whether you were looking at that on Google Earth or you had looked at it earlier in the summer, uh, plan for those contingencies. Um, the other, an, another important concept is trying to determine lodging. Um, lots of people, historically, we, we used to see lots of, of large camps set up on the landscape where people would come out and set up a wall tent and, and set up a camp for a week at a time or two weeks. And that that's, was their style of hunting. Um, we're seeing a trend more towards the, the day trips. Um, people choose to, to spend their, their evenings in a more comfortable environment and go down and find hotel rooms. Um, nothing wrong with that. I mean, let, let your hunt be enjoyable. You, you know, if whatever you want to do, um, that's, that's your hunt. Uh, if, if you are going to look into those kinds of things, it's important to determine, um, you know, a lot of these Western Slope communities, they, they have limited hotel resources. Some of them, they, um, by hunting season, they, they've closed up shop and a lot of the hotels are, are closed during hunting season. So call in advance, plan that out. Um, others, there's a lot of communities where those hotels will book several months in advance and they, they rely on the, the hunting clientele um, for their business. So, you know, just plan, make sure you know if the hotels are going to have, um, if they're going to have vacancies, what you need to, to do to accommodate some of that. Um, 
figure out your backup plans, you know, if, if you need to bring tents or whatever else. Um, also, you know, keep, if you do plan on going out and using a tent or a wall tent or something, never bad to have a backup plan that involves um, a retreat down into civilization. Uh, all too often people will come out here and they, they've packed a, a tent with them every intention of being out in the forest and we get 12 inches, you know, 15 inches of snow on the ground and that changes plans quick. So just make sure you've, you've accounted for that or at least considered it. Um, while you're out driving around, uh, be paying attention to the landscape. Pay attention to the high points, the, the places where you can access either via vehicle or, or foot. Um, look for places that you might be able to spend time and make your, your hunt efficient. Um, glassing points, points where you have easy access, um, points where you don't have easy access. Uh, that's the other, other portion of it is that you need to be paying attention to if it's easy for you to get to on by vehicle or foot, probably easy for somebody else to do the same um, and take that into consideration. You know, plan your hunt around not only what you and in, in, in your capabilities are, but all the other hunting public. Uh, they're probably paying attention to some similar factors and you want to be, you want to maximize your efforts as well. So um, that, that's an important concept is just knowing how many licenses are available, what the, the hunting pressure is in that area. In addition to that, something we see locally here, uh, a lot of these Western Slope communities is not only what the hunting pressures are in those areas, but there's a lot of other non-hunting re re related recreation occurring that time of year, especially if we get um, like an Indian summer and, and a warm fall. There's pe places where people go in, they scout in the first few months of the summer. Um, these bulls are in pristine condition and they, they see these basins back there where there's game everywhere. They come back to visit during hunting season and suddenly those basins are overrun by, you know, two, uh, 20 to 200 other people that are just out there backpacking, hiking, enjoying the, that environment, which is great, but that can obviously affect your hunt. Um, so know the, know the area, it, it pays to, to go and, and utilize those areas, um, visit some of the, the different recreation forums, some of, um, you know, talk to some of the, the local, either whether it's CPW staff, um, other land management agencies and get a feel for what you're going to be expecting. Um, again, not, none of that, I mean, all that's great information, but it's stuff that you need to be able to ground truth. Go in there and you, you will be able to tell whenever you set your boots on the ground, how frequently that trail is actually used. Um, if the trail that you're seeing on Google Earth, if that's a game trail or if that's a, a hiking trail where, you know, there's 20 other people while you're hiking on there for the one hour period. Um, I think the last thing that I'll, I'll add in there is as you're learning all this, make, make sure you, you take notes, you, you start plotting some, some GPS points, um, you know, figure out areas where, uh, you know, make sure that you, you are utilizing all of your, your resources and your references so that you can go back during your hunt and you don't have to remember everything about it. If you've gone in there and, and hiked for a half mile, take notes on what you're seeing um, you know, what you're observing so that you can utilize that um, during your hunt and, and kind of make yourself a little bit more efficient. The, the, the very last thing is kind of just a, a kind of a cautionary note that I'll also include in there. Um, you know, a lot of this terrain, it looks very different on Google Earth or, or on some of these other websites. It's super important for you to go out there and just because a hillside looks like the brush is, is low um, or it doesn't look very steep, you need to be able to go out there and, and know what that substrate feels like under your own feet and what the limitations are. Um, part of planning your hunt is also looking at the, if, if you do are, are fortunate enough to harvest an animal, what that's going to mean whenever you're trying to pack that animal out. And all too often, that's where people get into a jam is it's, it's, you know, you have a lot of adrenaline and motivation to get into an area when you're pulling an animal out and you've ma you're making your third or fourth trip in. Um, that's where, where things can kind of get difficult. Make sure while you're doing your scouting, some of this, this planning, <clears throat> you've considered that um, and that you've considered it, you know, in the form of being able to actually say that, yeah, I've hiked it before. I know I can do it again and I know I can do it two or three times if need be. Um, in, in addition to that, <clears throat> you know, you're, if you're out there on the ground, you can try to verify some of these places that have cell signal, um, don't have cell, cell service, you know what your you know what your backup plans are if you were to get injured if you were to get lost um, so that, that's that's an important part too I'll leave it at that there's a lot of other information for some of the other panelists to cover um, thanks for joining us and hope you guys are learning something
All right, so we're going to do a poll in a second before we move on. But first, I would like everyone to, to note that if you want to see all the answers to the Q&As uh, that pe other people are asking, you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom, and you can actually see all of our responses to the questions other people are asking. A lot of people ask, ask similar questions, so you might, might be helped out there. All right, so we're going to launch our first poll. This is one of my favorite parts. So the first question is, if you've hunted before, can you rate the percent of time you dedicated to scouting? So out of all of the time that you spend hunting, what percent would you say is spent scouting? If you, if you just show up on, on game day and go, go right to your spot without checking it out, that's none. And if you're like Courtney, it's gonna, where every time you go outside, you're, you're basically doing it for a hunt and scouting, that would be more than 40%. So um, let us know how much you scout. We still got some answers coming in. All right, slowing down. Got 73% of y'all have answered. We're going to end the poll in about five seconds. Five, four, three, Two, one, all right, ending poll. And I'm gonna share these results with you. All right, so it looks like the majority by a little bit was about 20 to 40%. And uh, next up is, you know, giving it, a, giving it a good look over the day before a hunt. Excellent, not some of you uh, like me <laughs> have to admit <laughs> pretty much none. <laughs> and uh, then there's some like Courtney more than 40%. I keep picking on Courtney because she's, she's always talking about this. So, all right, we are going on to our next subject and that's going to be Logan. And he's going to be talking about scouting for game patterns. And I, I think he's going to answer some of the questions you, you guys have been asking in a little bit more detail. Logan, take it away. All right, so I'll try and get to most of those. Um, so scouting for game patterns um, and kind of how I do this will depend on the strategy that I'm planning on using to hunt that particular species or that season. Um, and so what that means is if I'm uh, like out here on the plains, gonna be setting up a tree stand along the river or uh, you know trying to ambush something, uh, then I wanna be out scouting um, ahead of time, whether that's you know the week before I get to go hunting um, earlier that summer and trying to figuring out those patterns of when I need to be in that location. Um, so that does mean I'm going to be up, you know, in the dark, getting to a location where I can see. Um, and I like to do it from a distance if at all possible. Uh, this also works really well in the mountains to find some of those locations. If you can't just go out and hike, um, you know, like me, I live in Lyman. And if I'm trying to find a place that I can glass and do some of that scouting, um, for elk in the mountains, um, Google Earth is a great tool to try and, uh, you know, roam around uh, the topography of where I'm going to be at and find some spots that I might want to get to or be able to get to um, and have a, a decent chance of seeing uh, a lot of country that I want to see. Um, but I, I am going to try and be in that location um, so I can see where those animals are moving, specifically if there's a water hole or a trail or uh, just some sort of a travel corridor or a funnel. Um, I want to be at those places. If I think they're they're passing through those at first light, um, I want to be able to see that um, or at last light, same sort of deal. So getting up um, early or late um, out here on the plains, if, if I am going to be doing more of a spot and stock type of deal, um, I may not necessarily need to be at that location um, quite as early because I want to see where that animal ends up going to bed down. Um, or just uh, if I can view some of those places from a distance uh, throughout the day and just find a good location, I don't necessarily have to be there as early. Um, but trying to find a place that you can see and, and scout from a distance is definitely beneficial because you're not blowing those animals out. You're not giving them uh, any indication that they're being hunted or pursued. So they're, they're going about their daily lives um, without any uh, concern of that. And animals generally um, tend to be fairly uh, habitual, just like us humans. Um, you know, most of us get up and have the same type of routine in the morning. Um, you know, take a shower, brush your teeth, have breakfast, things like that. So animals definitely um, kind of tend to do the same sort of thing. And they'll get up, go to water, they'll get up and go to, uh, sorry, animals don't brush their teeth, Crystal. Um, but they'll get up, go get water, go get food or whatever, and tr usually travel the same sort of corridors um, why they're doing that 
Um, and so it's good to, good to be there. Um, and I try and do it, you know, more than one time. Um, if you see an animal doing something, um, you want to confirm that that's kind of its habit uh, rather than just a one-time deal. So um, revisit those locations if you can multiple times, a couple of days in a row to be sure that that's, that's their habit of what they're doing and not necessarily uh, just a one-time deal if something else spooked them. Um, another thing to watch for is if, uh, if you do get the opportunity to see where animals go when they are alerted or alarmed um, and kind of what their escape routes are going to be from a drainage or from a place that they're at, if they exit through the same uh, funnel or the same saddle every time they get spooked, um, that might be an area that you might, you know, if you're hunting a high pressure situation where there's lots of hunters around, um, you know, it might be an area to set up knowing that somebody else is likely to push those animals to you. Um, kind of the last couple things I'll, I'll touch on um, are uh, take, take notes. Um, if you have paper maps, write on those maps, draw on those maps, um, you know, really study what you think those animals are doing. Um, taking notes, writing down what time you saw what animal, um, what time you saw what group of animals, if there's more than, you know, uh, one group using the same area. Um, things like that, write it down so you don't forget. Um, write down what time you saw them. Uh, animals don't have watches, um, but they, you know, having that habit will get up and mosey along at generally the same pace. And um, there's a lot of times where you can kind of time animals coming through a corridor um, in their routine within a half an hour of itself from day to day, um, knowing how weather and things like that will change it. If it's been foggy for two or three days and that animal's used to traveling through a certain area in the dark, um, and then all of a sudden it's a clear morning, then they may show up at that area in the daylight. Um, so just keeping track of things like that. Game cameras, um, I think are uh, a really fun tool to utilize, um, putting them over water holes on uh, scrapes for deer, rubs for, for deer and elk, um, travel corridors or on, you know, uh, where a couple of major trails cross themselves, setting those up so that you can see and go back and look at pictures and see what time uh, of day or night those animals are traveling through there, trying to get a, an idea of which direction they're going um, to kind of figure out where their, um, their feeding area or their bedding area might be, depending on the type of day, time of day and, and where they're going through there. Um, those are a great resource to use. Um, a couple of things that I'll note with that, um, per our regulations, uh, the uh, trail cameras that um, uh, are, I, I guess, live action is what we call them, where they will send your cell phone or your computer a text message or an email with a picture um, right when it takes it. Um, if it has any sort of service to wirely transfer that information to you, those are not legal to use in Colorado for scouting or hunting purposes. Um, if you uh, are, I guess for hunting purposes, if you are using those, um, you have to wait um, two days to hunt that area from when you got that image. Um, so uh, make sure that, that you're keeping that in mind if you're purchasing that type of, of camera. Um, you, you can use it, but you have to wait two days from the time you got the last picture from that camera before you can hunt in that area. Um, and then the other thing, just along with uh, technology use, um, as far as regulations, drones are not permitted um, for scouting uh, at all um, or hunting. So leave those at home and don't use them for this activity. Um, and I think that's about wraps it up for me for that section. Great, thank you. All right, next we are going to Brian. We're going back to Brian. He is going to talk about scouting to understand landscape and habitat needs. A lot of folks asked these questions during our digital scouting, virtual scouting webinar the first week about more specifics on um, how to tell what the different landscapes mean, topography means, and Brian is going to explain more right now. All right, I'm gonna uh, share a screen in just a minute. Um, we'll probably do we'll probably do another poll maybe after I am finished talking if that sounds all right. All right, so I'm gonna talk to you about understanding the landscape, understanding habitat needs. So if you've ever been to a, one of my programs that I've done some seminars, if I'm talking about elk, I'm talking about deer, turkey, whatever, I, I really like to focus on habitat. And we've talked about this in previous things. So I'm just gonna review it if, if people are new on this one. You gotta think about habitat. And, and I, I have four different parts to habitat. You might call them something different, but there's food, there's water, 
their shelter. Those are the main three. And then the fourth one is its arrangement across the landscape. And we're gonna be looking at some photos to try and understand some of that. So I'm going to share a screen. Let's hope I can do this correctly. All right, um, do you guys all see that screen? Awesome, good. So this is uh, one of my favorite places in the whole world to go hunting. Um, there's some great elk hunting here, as well as, um, you know, deer, you know, little of everything out there. So, um, so I'm gonna um, kind of break a little bit of this landscape down. So if we're talking about elk and we're looking at f the food component of their habitat, you gotta understand that elk feed slightly different than deer. Elk are more of a grazer, much like cows. They, they primarily feed on grasses, not 100%, but primarily on grasses. There are, um, yeah, yeah, elk will, will definitely browse, kind of like deer are more of a browser. So they're, they're not on extremes, but they are, um, they primarily the elk are gonna focus on grass. So when I look at this landscape, hopefully you can see the cursor moving across the landscape here. I look at the landscape and I see this is an open meadow of some sort right in here. The green sections that you see, those, that's what I call dark timber. That's gonna be shelter primarily. Some of this lighter color um, grays that are in here, this is aspen, and this is gonna be early November. So most of the leaves have fallen. They're sitting on the ground, nice and dried out. So when you step across them, it sounds like you're stepping on potato chips. So out here, if you think about elk, where are they gonna feed? Well, they're probably gonna go find places where they've got good palatable grass. Okay, so you might think some of these meadows. The grass is probably gonna be more palatable, gonna have more energy when it's exposed to the sun more, right? Photosynthesis kicks in on these slopes that are facing the sun. This is a south facing slope, gets good sun exposure, great photosynthesis. Elk are gonna focus in on that to feed. Water is gonna be probably in a slightly different location. And it could be, you'll kind of notice this dark timber right here, just to kind of put you in perspective, this is a ridge line that separates north and south aspects. So the south aspect is going to have um, exposure to the sun. It dries out the soils. It can't um, support the growth of a whole lot of trees. The north facing slope that holds a lot more moisture. It stays cooler. It can support growing trees. So this north facing slope is a pattern on the landscape that you want to think about. As you drop down that north facing slope, you're going to come to the other side out of view and that's going to be a drainage before it goes uphill and it starts becoming a meadow or a drier slope, fewer trees. So there could be a great water source running through that drainage up and down. If you followed that drainage, I bet if you continued walking up that drainage, you might find a spring of some sort up that hill. A spring is where the water table um, basically it gets exposed over the surface, right? So there's water under the ground. Um, it fluctuates from year to year. Drought years, it's gonna be lower. Some of these springs might not be available. Um, nice wet years, or maybe coming after a wet snowpack, that water table may be higher and you may have some springs. Or, you know, come elk rut, it might be a wallow that those bowls go in <clears throat> and rut. So there could be water source <clears throat> along these drainages. So. Maybe they feed in this meadow, or if I move off over here, there's a lot more meadows over here. They can feed, and then maybe they gotta move across the landscape and find a good water source. Some drainages will hold water, some of them won't. So part of your scouting, you're gonna be looking at some of that, the attributes on the landscape. So we're learning the patterns of the landscape, we're learning the patterns of habitat. So we, we're kind of talking about some of the um, food for elk, um, if you're hunting deer though, I might not see quite as much deer in here. And, and when I went out and I scouted this um, on my hunting trips, I noticed that this is primarily grass right in here. And I do see elk, I see elk scat. But where I see deer is I come down here and I see deer in this little area. There, I get a little more sagebrush. Um, I'm closer to the drainage where I have willows. So if deer are primarily a browser eating the shoots of um, shrubs, like the, the little um, uh, edges of the, of the branches of shrubs, 
or they might be eating flowering plants or forbs, right? So the, the shoots of shrubs and flowering plants, that's a different cell structure than a grass, right? And, and it takes a different digestive system to really get into the, the, the um, nutritive components um, embedded in the cell walls of those plants. That's why deer feed in, in one area primarily, elk feed, might feed in another. So understanding as you walk through the landscape, start looking at it, even though it's a meadow, kind of as you move through, do you have some sagebrush in there? Do you have willows at the bottom? Um, do you have um, maybe more flowering plants mixed in than grass in these areas? And it might help you understand the distribution of where you might find elk versus where you might find deer. On this landscape, um, we talked about the dark timber, this green stuff. We also have aspen. This is gonna be the shelter that we talk about, right? That's kind of that third component, shelter or cover. And when I talk about shelter or cover, I break it down into three different areas. Usually the, the main use of this is gonna be some type of bedding cover of some sort. So nighttime beds, daytime beds. They're, they're going into cover for a couple of reasons. Um, some of it's just to get away from predators. Some of it's just, it's cooler, um, it, it, it's more protected. Um, Sometimes though, cover becomes escape cover. So if some elk are feeding in the meadow right here, they're probably not gonna get super far away from the edge of cover. They may be you know, mid slope of the meadow, but if, if a predator comes or they don't feel safe, they're gonna bolt to some cover somewhere. Um, and, and that cover provides escape cover. In the winter time, this also can be thermal cover. So the trees, especially the dark timber, is going to capture the snow. So, so the, the meadows may actually get deeper snow unless they melt out on a south face, but some of these meadows might have deep snow, but the travel corridors in the, the late winter might be easier through the trees because it's captured some of the snowfall. So something to think about. Um, if, if elk or deer aren't able to travel across a landscape between all their habitat needs, they're probably gonna migrate and they're gonna start moving on to some winter range. So if they can't get their food, if they can't get their water, and if travel to move across the landscape is challenging, they're just not gonna get it. Um, other, other parts to cover around here, um, just looking at some of this, there's a bench that runs through here. There's steep slopes out here, but there's a bench right across here that isn't very steep and it'll connect. Here's some food, they'll have cover that they can walk across and maybe they find water down in this drainage. And then they may go back in this cover and this saddle on the top, they may cross right over that saddle to go to their day bed. So I'm trying to think about the landscape where they meet all three of their needs every morning, sometimes at noon, and sometimes in the evening, right? So morning and evening primarily, they're, they're going to feed, Maybe they're going across landscape to get water, and then maybe they're they're moving someplace else, and they're going to um, cross, and they're going to go get some, um, go go someplace to find their day bed. At, in the evening, they're going to go find someplace to get their nighttime bed. So I'm going to attempt to share or uh, or uh, move another photo here. All right. <clears throat> so this next photo, this is a, actually the same slope, so I'm not going to um, go into a whole lot of detail, but off the the um, I'm going to kind of show you the same area. So this area right here that I got my cursor on, that is the same area from a different perspective as this area right here. So I'm on a, I, I took these photos from different spotting locations, right? I'm looking at stuff that might be miles away, but I'm, I'm starting to learn patterns. I've got three meadows on the landscape. One, two, three. I've got more meadows on the landscape. I've got a bench of aspen that runs all the way around at the base of the steep slope out here. Understanding where I might find elk, boy, every single time I'm, I'm out here in the morning or later in the day, I almost find elk that are in one of these meadows, oftentimes up high. I might find some deer down low, or if I push through some of this aspen, I might find deer interior of the aspen. I'm going to show you a photo um, of a couple of things. This is a just a little more blown up um, perspective and, and I just I'm just showing you this. This is meadow one, this is meadow two. Um, on an elk hunt that I had one time I had a cow tag and I had walked up this ridge line 
I had um, gotten to a place right about in here and I started to come down through that timber. I got about halfway and I saw 11 bull elk, probably 70 yards, just move right across the landscape and over the hill. Um, their nighttime bed was in here. They fee fed across here. They probably went across, got some water, and went over the other side of the mountain for their day bed, right? I had a cow tag, they were all bulls. So I, I think they can smell the cow tags. All right, this is a different photo. Um, let me back up another photo. So, so it, you can kind of see the patterns. On the right side of this is dark timber, so mostly north facing slope. Well, if you look on the back side of that ridge line, it's kind of shaded in, in some clouds, but on the back side, that's almost dark timber. So I'm gonna look, we're gonna look at that from the other side. This is the back side of that mountain. It's almost all dark timber. There's just a couple little holes here and there where there isn't a whole lot of trees, but it's dark, dark timber, a lot of uh, blow down. This is great. Um, place for, for elk to get into and bed during the day because it's really hard to approach. I took my son hunting out here because I knew this was dark timber. Other people are hunting the other side. Looking at this meadow, um, I could see this when I did some virtual scouting. So I took my son out here. We crept up behind some trees to this meadow and sure enough, there's elk moving across the landscape. They weren't in the middle of this meadow exposing themselves. They're on the edge, real close to escape cover. And sure enough, he's able to harvest one now. So again, I'm, I'm using um, patterns of movement between habitat, food and water, trying to understand where elk might be on the landscape. This is a great picture. I wish this was me. I was carrying um, rear quarters down for one of my friends. But I want you to see the landscape here, right? So it's a cool photo, but start looking at the ground. It, you should see you got some sagebrush. You got some, a mix of grasses in here. You've got an aspen tree and, and sure enough, the aspen has some little marks on it where um, the elk in the wintertime may have been stripping the bark because the grasses all, all sucked all their nutrients down in the roots. So the grasses weren't good anymore in a previous year. They started scarring this lower side of the aspen, feeding on that to get new nutrition. As I move to the next picture, sure, this is a nice looking buck, but I want you to look at the landscape around it. You can see aspen in the background. You see blow down in the background as well from some of the aspen trees that have died and fallen over. The aspen have more and more chew marks on them where the elk have come through later in the season. But look, the skinny little pieces in here, these are the shoots of aspen. And if you start looking at this area is just full of shoots. This is a wonderful place to be thinking about for mule deer. There's what you can't see in this area but this is an area where you have a couple of ridges that, that come together and it, it's a saddle between a couple of ridges and it moves, it allows animals to move from one drainage over the ridge line to the other drainage. And sure enough, um, this hunter knows where to find deer and as he's coming across this area, sure enough, the buck is moving through. So we got food, understory, um, we've got grass, there could be elk moving through here as well. But so it's a great picture of a of um, you know a nice buck, but important that you start picking up on some of these key points um, on the landscape as you're walking across, right? What is that food source? Again, this is a nice looking um, five by five bull elk. This is all kind of in the, the, that same area. But look at the aspen. You see the scars on the aspen. This is from animals that are um, probably chewing um, the lower end of the bark here. But you see, there's a lot of grass in this area. This is coming across um, a whole bench, right? A flat area on the landscape of connective cover and it connects um, cover to a mosaic of meadows where the elk feed. So knowing the landscape, we're able to set some hunters out. And, and even though this wasn't my elk, one of my hunting buddies was able to harvest and he knows they come across this area. And one last um, photo here, just kind of think about this. If you look at this, you're looking at like the bottom of a drainage. You see a lot of, um, you know, mountain riparian, um, some willows or some other, other shrubs that are in the bottom there. I would not expect to see a whole lot of elk in this area. Um, I'd probably see, there'd probably be some moose in that area, but I would probably be expecting there'd be some deer maybe that move through um, feeding on some of the shrubs. 
And so maybe as I'm, if, if I'm hunting in this area, I might find a place where I get a good overlook of that area or in the morning, later in the day, and maybe I got some movement coming through here. This is pretty thick. Usually I like a little um, less thick area when I'm looking for some, some good mule deer habitat. So, all right, I am going to stop sharing. Um, and so, so I just want to kind of throw out there the concept that food, water, shelter, understanding the different forms of shelter, but that mosaic across that landscape, the arrangement of those features is super important. And when you go out there, start looking for those patterns, start taking notes into your, if you got a hunting journal with you, put it into your GPS. So um, I'm gonna throw it out there to the panel. What do you have to add to any of that understanding of the habitat or the landscape? Call on myself, Crystal. Can you, yes, did you have something to say? <laughs> I wanted to talk a little bit about the Eastern Plains. Um, a lot of people tend to forget we have those. Um, so, <laughs> so that's where I have done my deer hunting. And one of the things I did not know until I actually went out there into deer hunting areas is that there are huge canyons out there. They're absolutely gorgeous. And unlike a mountain where the sun hits the south side in a canyon, the sun actually hits the, the north inner side. So that's where um, during the daytime, the deer bed down. And so I've done some really good armed hiking um, through those canyons and um, they're just absolutely uh, gorgeous as well. A lot of people don't realize how gorgeous the Eastern Plains are. And another thing to look out for, which on Google Maps or a hunting atlas uh, that's really easy to spot is the riparian areas, which means like anywhere there's a, a river or a stream and then there's a bunch of trees and oh my gosh, just going to scout out there to sit by those and just watch the wildlife and to listen to it. It's so loud and it is one of the most peaceful experiences ever. So don't underestimate the plains. They are absolutely gorgeous. They just build highways through the boring parts. Okay. All right. Uh, Logan, anything else about the plains that I missed? I know you're a plains guy. <laughs> yeah. So um, after you said that, a couple of things. Um, so we have both mule deer and white tail out here on the plains. Um, the white tail are typically in the more riparian areas. They like a lot more thicker cover. Um, and what I find is um, if I'm hunting an area that has both white tails and mule deer, um, the white tails will hunker down in very tall grass or um, kind of the deeper part of a crevice of a canyon. Um, and you, you can almost walk right up on them um, before they'll leave um, and not even know that they're there. Um, they like to be hid and if they feel like they're hid, they'll stay put. So um, when it comes to hunting whitetails um, and looking for cover outside of their riparian area and stuff, I look for what's, you know, where can it hunker down and feel hidden and safe and secure um, and it'll probably stay there. Um, mule deer, on the other hand, um, tend to like to see what's going on um and especially like in the sand hills um so i don't have a map to show you but like if my hand was a hill and the wind is running um from this side this way those deer will lay down just over the crest of that hill to where they can smell anything coming up from behind them um, and they can see anything coming out from in front of them um, on this side and so um if it's not uh, a super windy day or, or, or really bad weather, they'll be up here and pretty easy to see. And it doesn't matter really where the sun's at, um, in my experience. Um, it's more which direction the prevailing wind is coming. And so um, if the wind's coming from the northwest um, and I'm hunting a, a section pasture, then I'll come in on the southeast corner of that and I'll kind of zigzag my way through there being real careful as I come over each hill and glassing everywhere that I can see to make sure there's not deer bedded um, on the next overhang of the next hill. And I'll just work my way across the pastures like that. And it works really well, especially on the plains, there's a lot of roads. Um, so, you know, you can park on the road, drive down the road and you can glass a lot of that country um, with the wind in your face. Um, and then when it comes time to make a stock, I generally try to kind of come from the side with a crosswind um, to get within range um, because I'm taking away some of their visual um, advantage as well as their ability to smell me and not coming from directly down the road. Yeah, great. The, the planes, uh, right? Animals need 
need food, water, shelter, um, and, and a mosaic on the planes as well. So I, uh, I think you can apply a lot of these. It's just maybe not quite so steep of slopes, but, but there's definitely a lot of topography as you get out east. There's a lot of food from agricultural uh, lands out there too. So, um, Yep. And Brian, add to that, the, the agriculture will change. There's not, a, I guess, as much of a migration route between summer and winter range um, out here, um, but they will utilize different forms of agriculture as they go through um, the fall. And once like the corn's picked, there's a lot of cover and a lot of food that has been lost. So they'll, they'll move um, just to different parts of that same area to find cover and, and, and shelter, but they'll still be within, you know, a couple miles of where they've been hanging out. Can I add something to that? Absolutely. He talked about winter and summer ranges and for those new hunters that are on the call are on the zoom right now i think one of the most important aspects to scouting hands down from everything these guys have shared is utilizing the elk concentrations the deer concentrations the antelope concentrations that cpw has on their website and then um, once you do that you have an area if you're gonna if you they take a formula and with the game wardens and every and the aerials that they do they mark concentrations of animals in the winter so if you're going to do a rifle hunt you'll want to know where that's at and their migratory um corridors and then if you're a bow hunter and a muzzle loader you'll want to know their summer concentrations so you can take a huge area and just by looking at their concentrations with the colorado parks and wildlife you have narrowed it down to where most of the animals migrate too. You happen to be hunting one of the most migratory animals other than uh, caribou is elk. So I think that's one of the best tools out there and then having the software that shows you exactly you know how to get in there at dark and, and scout that and stuff. But for those people that can't do a lot of scouting really look at those concentrations from Turkey, the eastern plains, the whole nine yards, the whole state, CPW has those. Great. All right, we are, if anybody, does anybody else have anything to add on that subject before we move on to a poll? Hmm? No? Okay, so it's poll time, everyone. Yay! All right, so the next poll is regarding next week's webinar topic. For next week's webinar topic, we're not over yet. It may sound like we're wrapping up. We are not wrapping up, okay. But in advance, for next week's webinar on hunting tactics, can you choose the topic that you are the least confident in? The thing you are least confident in? Identifying habitat, identifying species or gender, choosing the right tactic, and finding lands to hunt. So what you are least confident in, would like the most help with, for me, I would probably say choosing the right tactic would be mine. Um, yeah. All right, polls are coming in, the votes are coming. Got 75% have answered. That's a, that's a lot, all right. Starting to slow down. I'll give everyone about five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, <laughs> end poll. i share the results with you all. So it looks like choosing the right tactic. I'm in the majority, um, identifying species or gender. Y'all have been studying up apparently. Finding lands to hunt is also very popular. So we'll definitely make sure to cover, cover those and identifying habitat. Hopefully by the end of this, we will be a little bit <laughs> better at that, all of us. <laughs> so we are going to go on to our next topic. So can we get a virtual drum roll for Courtney who is going to be talking about Sign! Oh, this is great. Courtney, <laughs> not only is she going to be talking about signs on trails or signs that are markings on trees, it will help answer some of the questions that have come in, um, but she's also going to be talking about poop. <laughs> so, Courtney, take it away. Hey, everybody. Um, so, as uh, Crystal said, I am always scouting mostly because I don't like hiking um, unless I'm on my way to go somewhere to fish or I'm scouting or I'm looking for sheds which is also a great way to scout. Um, 
but yeah, I'm going to talk about just some of the different signs that you can see um, while you're out and about scouting. So always be looking underfoot. I'm pretty much always looking down, never looking up. I do bump into a lot, a lot of things. But um, the first thing I want to talk about is game trails. So game trails, typically, if you're in an area that has animals moving in and out of it throughout the year, um, migrating through it, you're going to see game trails. So game trails are just worn down kind of natural paths, just like a human would make um, in the grass and in the dirt. So you'll see they'll usually be, you know, about the size of the animal going through it. Um, not necessarily the size of their body, somewhere in between the size of their body and the size of their tracks that they're making. Um, so game trails are a really awesome way to figure out if there's any animals in the area that you're wanting to hunt, right? Isn't that the first thing we want to know? But you can also tell um, the herd size um, by how many tracks there are. A lot of times you can also tell the direction that they're traveling in. Um, so a couple other people had mentioned, you know, it's good to find a lot of other um, trails that you can find. Where are they going when they get alarmed? Where are their escape routes? So the direction can tell you a lot of things as well. If you're looking in areas that are a little bit softer, um, the depth of them a lot of times can also tell you the size and weight of the animal. So if you see a really large elk track and it's really sunken into the earth, might give you a better uh, understanding that that maybe was a heavier animal. Um, and sometimes you're able to see the dew claws on the tracks as well, so you might be able to tell roughly the gender, um, you know, in the herd. Um, so you're going to want to look for tracks around game trails, around water sources, um, if you find any scat, poop, um, looking for tracks around them. Um, but anywhere where there's soft earth, um, also on the opposite, if there's kind of really, really dry earth, sand, kind of like a top layer of sand, you'll be able to see um, those tracks. So aging them can be very, very difficult. Um, so there isn't usually a good way that I found um, to tell necessarily how old they are unless they're super, super fresh, right? So that track might have been made in the mud, um, could have dried out, and it could be from last year. You know, if it's an area that doesn't have a lot of foot traffic, doesn't have a lot of rain, doesn't have a lot of wind that's really scraping up that earth, that track could be pretty old. Um, but I feel like all tracks are good tracks. Um, there was an area that um, I was shed hunting in and scouting while I was shed hunting. And um, I was seeing lots and lots and lots and lots of tracks and lots of scat, but it all looked very, very old. But there was tons of it. So that can kind of give you a good idea of, you know, just the animals that are living in the area. Um, so talking about scat, talking about poop. So as you get closer to the season starting is when you're really going to want to start to age that. So right now, shed hunting, as we've talked a little bit about, if I'm finding fresh scat, and even if I'm spotting animals in the area that I'm shed hunting in right now, does not mean that, that, that animals are going to be there come hunting season. Um, so when you're getting closer, when you're scouting just a couple of weeks before season starting is when you're really starting to pay attention to how fresh is that scat. So pretty much if you just take your boot or take a stick and just kind of smudge it, crush it, and see what color is on the inside. If it is super, super soft and it's bright, bright green on the inside, that's a good indicator. That's probably only a day or two old. Um, once it starts to dry out, it kind of stays in that pellet cocoa puff kind of shape and you're not very easy, uh, easily able to crush it. Um, and then it will kind of turn brown all the way through and you won't really see that vibrant green anymore. Um, so that's kind of as you're getting closer to hunting season and you're scouting specifically in the area that you're going to be hunting. Um, hopefully that'll tell you, you know, that animal is there 
just the day before. Um, scrapes and rubs. Um, so this is something that is also a good indicator of animals that are in the area. Um, so scrapes are going to be, um, you know, on trees. You also might see a really small tree that's totally destroyed. You know, maybe a tree that's two or three feet tall that has absolutely no side branches on it. And just looks like a giant toothpick sticking up from the earth. Um, that's going to tell you um, that there's definitely animals in the area. Um, and so they're also going to be fresher leading up to the rut. So, you know, you can kind of tell on a tree if there's been a lot of action on it, scraping antlers against it, and it's had time to heal. Um, if it's been a couple years, um, if it's a tree that's been um, scraped on really, really recently, um, then, you know, you can still see that the inner um, pulp of the tree is still wet visibly wet. Um, if it's a type of tree that's going to have a sap some coming out of it, you'll see that there'll still be sap dripping out of it. Um, and really just that the inside of the tree is still um, moist. Um, so the last thing that's um, important to look at is for springs and wallows. So um, where I go elk hunting, there is a natural wallow that um, I kind of see every single year. And it's a, it's a great starting point, right? So um, I like to put a trail camera on it and, and you know, check it every, you know, every so often and just see, you know, what's coming through there. Um, and it'll give you a good indication um, what time of day those animals are using the wallow. Is it the morning? Is it the evening? Is it both a lot of times? Um, and then helping you decide where you're going to want to set up to hunt. Um, so if you want to hunt on a spring, if you want to hunt on a wallow, if you want to hunt on a meadow, um, and paying attention to the game trails going through there. Um, where I like to elk hunt, there's two wallows, there's a couple open meadows and a spring, and you can clearly see the game trails of them just kind of walking around in this area um, throughout the day over and over again. Um, so let me just read some of these questions, see if anyone has anything else I'm gonna wrap up on. Um, mm -hmm. Tracks, yep, it is tough a lot of times to see if tracks are, uh, are fresh. Um, Courtney, in the movies, they do it so easy. They always just like look down and they're like, these tracks are just a few hours old. Like, you can't right? Track. Exactly. I want to hunt with those people. Yeah. No, um, I want to hunt with like Legolas from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> yeah. So someone was talking about, um, so for Wallace, specifically for bulls, um, so animals are using Wallace for a couple different reasons. One is to cool down, especially during archery season. It is super hot out there you're hot out there, they're hot out there, so they're cooling down. But a lot of times what they're using it for is the bulls will actually go in there and spread their scent around. So they actually will urinate in the wallow um, and then they will roll around in their pee mud and they'll spread it all over their coat because um, that's, uh, that's what the lady elk um, find attractive. Um, so a wallow is just an area that's a, um, uh, soft spot in the earth and usually kind of all the grass and the rocks will be rubbed away from it. Usually it'll be just a thin layer of mud. It could be pretty deep. It could be just, just barely a little deep. Usually they might start to dry up, um, as it gets into the, um, later in the season. Um, and it's all kind of depending on the springs. So we have our snowpack melt and the springs are all running. And then at some point that water does dry up. So just because you have a wallow in the middle of the summer, it doesn't mean that wallow is still going to be there come hunting season. So it's just a natural area where some water pools, usually the springs come in and out of the ground as they're going down the hill. So it's just like a, a low depression. It's pretty much a bird bath for, for elk. Um, 
And so that's kind of all I've got um, to cover on looking for that. I will add two things. One, um, <clears throat> as I said, I'm always scouting, but you can also scout while you're hunting other species, right? So I do a lot of um, small game hunting. So, you know, when I'm out duck hunting, I'm definitely listening at sunrise. Like, are you hearing pheasants cackling? Um, are you seeing deer? Um, vice versa, when you're deer hunting, are you seeing ducks? And just write all of that down um, as you're going throughout the season. And so it might not be an area, if you're in a state wildlife area where big game hunting's allowed, but not small game or small game, but vice versa, it's definitely something to check on. Um, but you can scout year round. One other thing I wanted to touch on just because I'm very passionate about it, um, so a couple of people were asking about the game cameras um, that transmit the photos wirelessly and why we're not allowed to use that. Fair chase. So fair chase is something that as hunters we should all be really passionate about um, and we, I talked a lot about in my hunter ed class. And so a lot of the laws that are put onto hunters um, are really to support fair chase, right? So why are we not hunting at night? Why are we not, you know, utilizing infrared? Why are we not using drones? Um, is the same reason why we're not using these wireless transmitted game cameras. So um, someone had mentioned, what's the difference between me seeing an animal and then coming back and hunting it two days later? Um, it's very easy to sit on your couch and have your phone and have the, the um, photos being sent to your phone. Um, so it's, it's really just all about fair chase. So as hunters, that's, that's really something I'm passionate about. Um, and um, so that's really, as technology evolves, we need to figure out where we're gonna draw the line, right? About what is fair chase? Um, and what is the line between hunting and um, something that's, you know, too easy or, um, you know, no longer hunting as a, as a sport. So fair chase. Um, and that's all I've got. I, Courtney, I wanna, that was awesome. I, Thank you. Can I, uh, I want to add just one little tip that someone taught me. I'm going to pass it on. Um, if you're looking for um, tracks and sign, I think there's some questions about how do you tell if it's old or, or not. Um, one of the things that I do, if, if there's snow out in the area, um, the night before, I, I take a boot print in a kind of a safe area. I'm not gonna walk around. I, I pump my, my boot right into an area. Um, and then the next morning I can look at it. And I can see once how has that snow melted or changed a little bit. Right next to it in the morning, I pop another boot print. And so when I come back later that day, I can compare those two tracks and I know, hey, it's at least been 12 hours of difference. And so my boot track looks different. How does that impact um, stuff that's that, that you see out in the field as well. Um, you could try that if you've got some moist soils in the area as well. I just one of the things that I try to do. Sometimes I forget, but but it, it's helped me when I've done that. Um, I've I've shared that with some other hunters when we've gone out and and we've gone a couple days later and it's incredible the difference between day one and day three. So just a little thought there. That is ingenious. Thank you. We are going to do another poll, and then after that, Matt is going to cover a topic that I need a lot of information on. So before we get to that, we're going to do our last poll of the evening. Why do you hunt? What is your top reason for hunting? Meat in the freezer, quality time with family and friends, time outdoors, harvest a trophy wall hanger, Meat in the freezer. If, if it's another reason, that's great. But out of these ones, if you could give your, your best shot at this, it looks, ooh, it's a tight race between these two. All right. Hmm. It's a good question, Brian. Good, good for coming up with that one. All right, I'm gonna end the poll in five, four, three, two, one. Ending the poll. All right, so most of you, like me, I guess I'm just average here, you guys. I'm, all, I'm with the majority on all this. Meat in the freezer. Qual uh, quality time with friends and family, about 15%. The next, the second 
um, highest is time outdoors. And then 2% harvest a trophy wall hanger. And, you know, before I started hunting, my, per my perception of hunting was that most people wanted the trophy wall hangers. And it wasn't until I actually started hunting myself that I realized these other things were all options. So um, that's really interesting. Great. Thank you. All right. So Matt is up next with um, a topic I'm glad we're, we're covering, which is last minute scouting, which is, which is me. Um, I'm the procrastinator. Um, so Matt, if someone randomly, I'm asking for a friend, wasn't into all that preseason scouting and just went out the day before, a couple of days before their, their, their hunt, what would we need to know? I mean, like, what would my friend need to know? Take it away. So if you hypothetically had a friend who was going to procrastinate their hunt, um, no, I, that's a great, great question. E everybody's lives are busy. Um, you know, the best laid plans always change. And that's just, that's a fact of life. So uh, I think it's important to, to take into consideration, you know, what, what are you going to do? What is your plan? If everything else gets canceled or altered and you you are left to only your hunt or the one or two days before your hunt um, what are your best options in order to kind of maximize your time in the field um, i think a couple of different things to to kind of take into consideration is even if you haven't had a chance to go out and do much scouting whether it's online or um, or get out in the field in person it, hopefully you at least have a general basic knowledge of the kind of the biological concepts of whatever species you're hunting. Um, if you can kind of play that into the, in, into the equation and you can determine where those, you know, what the animals are feeding on, what they're, you know, what it looks like for, for water availability, um, that can really, really limit your, your need for going out and spending a lot of hours covering a lot of ground. Um, I think one of the, the big things is while you're if you're showing up right before your hunt um take into consideration that you know they're you're you're, you're doing it right what while you're you're going to be out there in the field looking for those critters so you don't want to be um, arbitrarily spending a lot of time cruising around potentially scaring animals out of areas where you either will be hunting or you are hunting and also if you're doing it a day or two before um you know, consider that there's probably other people in the area that are, are hunting as well. Um, you don't want to necessarily ruin their hunt either. So, um, you know, if you bump animals out of areas, it can kind of, it can mess up their, their routine. Um, it can displace them, especially when it comes to elk. Um, you know, you, you can bump elk out of an area and they may run several ridges over and not return to that, that same drainage for a while, um, if at all. So, if, if possible, I'd say if you're left to, to do your scouting um, kind of right during your hunt, if you can squeeze a day or two in beforehand, great, do that. Um, you know, spend those days going out and determining what the weather conditions are like, what the, the, the moon cycle is, what the light is. Um, you know, those are all things that are going to determine how those, what time of day those animals are up and, and moving, how they're moving, um, how far they're going to be moving. Um, keep that in, in mind. If it's something where you're going out there right during the, the season, the, the season's already started, honestly, I, I think it's, it's time well spent spending the, the first portion of your hunt you, using it as kind of almost scouting. If you come across an animal opportunistically, great, that's, that's phenomenal. Um, but I think there's a lot, of, a lot of the success can be attributed in a hunt, can be attributed to people just going out and learning that area where those animals are. They, I mean, those animals that you are pursuing are the, the resident experts. They know those hills, they know the, the terrain significantly better than we can ever imagine um, and ever hope to. So we're just trying to level the playing field by determining how, you know, what, what it is that they're seeing, what they're doing, how they're doing it. Um, if I, you know, there's a lot of times where, especially in my profession, um, I have to hunt the same seasons as everybody else, and but I'm also working during that time frame, uh, so that condenses my my ability to get out and and chase an elk on the hill. Um, you know, if if my hunt goes from being able to plan a three or four day hunt down to maybe it's a one day kind of thing, um, I'll go out there and and I'll I'll take a look at the the landscape, and the first few hours that I'm out there, I'm not being um, I'm not driven. 
by trying to cover as much ground as I can. Um, the, the first portion of, of that time is, is spent trying to determine, you know, any animals, how those animals getting out there and just laying eyes on anything um, and figuring out what they're doing. If they're hanging on north facing slopes, south facing slopes, if they're primarily utilizing the shade, um, if they are staying close to water sources, I, I, I will use that to that time frame to go and start looking for sign and figuring out where that sign is. And that sign will tell me a lot about how those animals have been utilizing that landscape in the recent past. Um, the last part, part of that is that after I spend my first portion of my scouting period doing that, um, I always, always, always keep in mind that I have to be adaptable. As much as I think I know about what those animals are doing or what they're thinking or how they're gonna act, um, it's gonna change. And I need to be, I need to not be driven by what I've known in the past, but what I'm learning in the present. Um, so as I go out there and I'm taking a look at it, I could have, um, I'm, I may have um, gone to an area that I've seen elk for 10 years, but something might, may have changed. And so whenever I, I go out there and I take a new hunt on, um, regardless of how many years I've hunted in that area or what experience I have there, I, I treat it as though it's my first time there and I'm trying to learn everything about what the animals are doing that year. Um, they, they, they'll change their patterns, they'll change the way that they use the landscape, they'll, they'll change forage species. Um, there's a lot that changes annually and sometimes it's for reasons that we can't know or we, don't, we can't tell. So just go out there and learn, learn the animal, learn the, learn the critter um, and try to, try to replicate what they're doing. Uh, that's kind of the best advice I can give and that that you know it's specific that a lot of times that's very specific to scouting while you're hunting or really close proximity to your hunt um, because if you're scouting two months in advance things can change you know before your hunt comes around so uh, I don't think there's any you know it might be a, a, a little bit of a disadvantage to um, not being able to scout in advance but I think that it's just that mental capacity of knowing that you have to, you, you're, you, you have to be efficient about what you're doing and how you're doing it um, if you're having to scout on your hunting trip. So um, no right, right, wrong answer, just, just knowing what you're out there and what you're up against, that's half the battle. Great, my friend will really appreciate all of that information. Uh, and I will refer them to the Colorado Parks and Wildlife YouTube page in a few days where this recording will be available for everybody so that my friend can hear everything you said about last minute scouting. All right, so the last discussion item, we are going to open it up to our whole panel and we are just gonna ask everyone what worked for you. Justin, I am specifically interested in your advice as a newbie to Colorado big game. Um, oh, gotcha. <laughs> um, uh, what, what have you recently learned? What is still something that um, even as a, a really experienced hunter, you, you're still curious about, um, let's hear from you. Sure. And sorry for having my camera off. I have a new puppy. So I've been running around, uh, trying to watch her and keep her from yapping. Uh, but so I've yet to have big game success. So I've been heavily reliant on mentorship and a mentorship network, which we'll talk about, um, in a later workshop but I just so happen to know Courtney. So I'll be relying on her uh, field scouting skills for sure and some of her advice and maybe tag along as she goes out. So I'd definitely suggest for any new hunters to try to get in touch uh, with one of your local chapters of one of the great organizations, mostly all nonprofits. I'm a member of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. They run a lot of great workshops and of course CPW will continue to have awesome workshops. Um, to check out. But one of the things that I really need more experience with is actually on the ground, boots on the ground, um, tracking and actually finding sign and things like that for big game. So I'm very used to finding habitat and things like that for upland and waterfowl, which tends to be easier. Um, but especially being new to a state, um, some of these tips they've talked about have been hugely helpful. And having limited time to really go out scouting, um, I feel like 
one of the things that I want to be able to do more is full day scouts where I'm able to replicate the hunt more or less, uh, get, up with dawn, get up at dawn and have my backpack and everything like that packed up as if I was actually doing the hunt and approach it that way. Um, but having limited time to actually get out there, I think I'll be utilizing any spare hour or two that I have to actually get out there. And I'd suggest uh, new hunters do the same because the more time you spend out in the field, um, the better off you are. Yeah, I definitely echo everything you said. My first big, well, my first big game hunt <laughs> was, uh, was definitely heavily mentored and the private land access is, was, was really instrumental for my first success. And um, being able to do the knocking on doors is really helpful because no one knows the land like a landowner. So um, they, can, they can also help give you advice if you do get on that private land. But I had so much help from, from mentors and fellow hunters um to, to to get me started on on my road of independence let's call it uh lisa last week was talking a little bit about this subject um lisa did you have anything you wanted to add is she there maybe she found like the world's most awesome shed <laughs> all right uh oh there she is hi lisa i'm does she sound like a I'm robot here. to anybody else? Can you hear me? You sound like a robot, which <laughs> we have found a moose shed in an elk shed. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so um we found a moose shed in an elk shed so far, so we're doing good. Um but I would just um you can't put enough time. I would highly recommend go scout where you're camping. You know, make it a purpose besides just camping with the family, go check out an area, say no. You know, to put yourself out there and do it. So um, I just would encourage you to break in those boots and do some scouting early. So, when uh, time comes, and I, like Courtney said, I'm like Courtney. If I'm out in the woods, I'm out here for a year. I'm hunting right now. It's fine. You can go. You could start doing that May first. Cool. All right. It was hard to hear you, but since you are doing something awesome, you are completely forgiven. All right. Anybody <laughs> else have anything about scouting? Any tips, Brendan? Let's go to you. Yeah, so I just kind of wanted to echo Matt a little bit about kind of knowing your 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 critter that you're hunting. Uh, I grew up hunting whitetails in Virginia, so about this time of year is when I was starting to get my tr trail cameras out on the property I was hunting, uh, trying to see what deer in the area. But I really kind of narrowed down where I was going to put those cameras based on that food, based on that cover water and then I would look within those areas where I could find that water and that food and find those tracks and find those rubs find old scrapes from the, from the year past so um, so finding that general area you know like Brian was trying to tell us finding those 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 components and those benches and those shelves um, that you could really use to your your benefit and then going deeper while you're scouting preseason or during your hunt um, and going in and finding those concentrated areas where you're going to find large amounts of tracks, rubs, and, and scat as well. So, um, like I said, just kind of an echo to all, all that. But uh, uh, to my my tip would be to just narrow down your focus once you find some of that broader stuff. If you can find the broad stuff, um, yeah, and use our maps as well, and and then narrow it down into tight areas, and then that's a good starting point uh, to go from. And then kind of use your your skills when you're out there in the field. Great. Um, anybody else? Yeah, I would, uh, to build on that, I love that idea of narrowing your scouting, right? So when people are saying, I don't know where to hunt, I don't know where to start, I don't know what unit um, to apply for, that's really kind of what we're doing is, is scouting is really narrowing down as you're getting closer to your hunt. So you're starting off by what unit am I going to hunt in? What unit am I going to apply to? From there, 
looking in that unit. So the unit that I hunt in has a lot of different wilderness areas and each of those have a lot of different trailheads that you can enter at. So I pick my unit then I'm going to pick the wilderness area within my unit. Then I'm going to pick the trailhead specifically that I'm going to park at. And then you're deciding how far you're going to go in. So where I hunt, it's, um, there's a kind of well-worn horse trail and it's along a tree, uh, creek. So first year I hunted there, we decided the farther you hike, the less people you're going to be able to see, right? And, uh, you know, the more dedicated you are. So we hiked in about six miles, uh, heard some bulls bugling off the first day, saw a lot of beds during the day, never saw an animal, spent five or six days and didn't see an animal. And we decided, okay, we're gonna pack up camp and we're gonna hike back towards the trailhead. And we hiked back about four miles and set up a new camp. All of a sudden we were in elk. So, the scouting is really, I like that idea of narrowing down where you're hunting. So once we picked the trailhead we were parking at, um, we had, I mean, we hiked in six miles and then every day we were probably hunting maybe a three to five mile radius. Um, so especially for elk, they're moving a lot. They're moving during the night. So, I mean, if you see them at night, they're moving throughout the night a lot of times. Um, and so really it's, it's a constant just like pinpointing throughout the season. Deer are, are a little bit different, but um, yeah, it's uh, scouting is I like that narrowing idea. Uh, Logan or who? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was gonna say for me, one of the things that's been really beneficial over the years is just continuing once I find a decent area um, right off the bat that I like and that I'm finding game, continue to hunt that same area every year um, and learn through the years as time goes on. And usually I end up being more successful in year two, three, and four in an area than I am going year one and then a new area and then a new area. Um, so spend that time while you're hunting, you know, logging and, and like we said, taking notes and just making mental notes even to to benefit you in the years to come by staying in the same area. Um, if you're finding animals, then that, that'll be very beneficial. Great. Uh, it's just about time to wrap up. I'm going to go to Brian. Brian. Super quick. I had to double check that. I didn't have any family on the attendees list, but one of the, one of the ways I find um, time to go scouting, I've got very limited time. I work a lot of weekends, don't have a whole lot of time off. So, um, I want to spend quality time with my family. Some of them might not be hunting with me. So we go for family drives and oftentimes we go in areas that I'm thinking about hunting. And so they don't realize it, but I've got the maps ready. And while we go out and we're, we're getting some snacks or getting a drink, I got the maps out and I'm, I'm making some no, notes as I was driving in. Um, we try to camp in some areas and while they're sleeping in, I might get up early. I can't sleep, so I'll get up early and try and find a spotting knob and get my binoculars out and see what I can see out there. So just, just little things like that. I can spill, still spend time, quality time with my family, but I'm starting to do some of that real general scouting. And if I see something that looks good, then I, I hopefully can plan some time, either a day, two days before the season, I can get in and, and do some scouting from the roads um, before blowing them out, going interior to the area. So that's just my thoughts. Pretty sure they're on to you, Brian. <laughs> All right, uh, Justin, would you mind holding up that puppy while I wrap up? Um, just so everyone can see this puppy. So I wanna thank everybody for coming tonight. We had several, like a couple hundred people. We had 227 I saw as a max and 163 of you stayed till the end, till right now. And your reward is to look at this puppy. Look at this puppy, look at it. Thank you so much for coming. Next week, we are going to talk about big game hunting strategies. So those are strategies while you're actually out on the hunt. This was before you go on the hunt and next week is going to be big game strategies. Brian, do you have anything you wanna say about that? Um, yeah, um, yeah, we're, we're gonna kinda talk about three basic strategies next week. Um, it isn't like you, you just have to do one strategy out in the field. So we're, we're going to talk about three basic ones. And we got a lot of different people that hunt in different ways. So 
Um, I think having, having a lot of panelists, you'll be able to hear different perspectives and you can kind of tailor your own hunt tactics um, that, that suits you. So should be good. Hope, hopefully everyone tunes in next week. Be sure to check our CPW YouTube page as well when we start to post these. Absolutely. And these will be posted. Blame me for not being able to figure out how to get Zoom videos onto our YouTube in a very quick method. Uh, I'm a little bit slow, but they will be up within the next day or two. I promise. And again, thank you so much, everybody. We just really appreciate it. And we hope you have a good night and safe hunting. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.